And hi, everybody. Thanks, uh, everyone, for being here uh, at the Brattleboro Literary Festival, which uh, I've, I've been here a couple times. I've been to the Literary Festival a couple of times. I think it's your first time, Roger. It is, absolutely. So I'm very happy to be here. You know, this is uh, the beauty of the beauty of uh, of Zoom is that we get to sort of appear suddenly and not like get in the car and drive up here. But uh, I, it would have been lovely to be in Brattleboro. I'm sorry not to be there. Um, anyone who wants to put in the chat, it's it's often nice to put in the chat um, like where you're from, where you're where you're zooming in from, or Facebooking in from. Uh, if you can, I guess it's live on Facebook also. I'm not sure if that even connects to Zoom though. I'm not sure if you can chat. I guess you can because we're going to do Q and A's from that. All right, so we're here to talk about books, our books. Uh, I had the great pleasure of reading uh, Cold Moon in this past, you know, preparing for this. And what, what a great book. What a really, really beautiful book. I was so happy. I read, I read uh, your work, you know, over, you know, getting ready for this too. read other passages. I really um, was, uh, it, it's been wonderful to get to know you through your, your words. So that's, I can't imagine a nicer introduction for, for me either. I, I just, uh, I'm just overwhelmed by the things that you've written about the, about the poems and, uh, and the prose. And um, I think I wrote you, 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 you feel breathless uh, reading, uh, reading Nick Flynn, um, breathless in the best sense. And then of course, since the subject is fire in the most recent uh, memoir, uh, it takes your breath away several ways. Um, yeah, I was thinking with your, your work, I haven't read like, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't read like the earlier work, but this new book is like so like the word is like it's just so like limber and fluid and just like moves so beautifully like from like through your your through your memories and through your uh, uh, like connections of images. You had this beautiful phrase. Can I, can I read a little passage uh, to you to oh, all of you? But this is this is just reading from um, uh, this is reading uh, some of Roger's work to him uh, on page thirty four because you you bring up a um, a term which I think is uh, uh, important. Uh, Jasmine, like Bill Evans and Miles Davis, as if there could be anyone like them, are masters of the ostinato, the repeated phrase or theme. So practiced are they in this art that five levels of ostinatos can be reached and detected at once. The effect is a mystery. You remember hearing something that you hear for the first time. One may try for that effect in writing too. Life, love, and responsibility. In the ostinatos of these fragments, can you can you make out the tune? See, you know, uh, yeah. So I just thought that that idea of the ostina ostinato. Um, maybe you could just sort of riff a little on that for us. Uh, riff, is the, riff, is, riff is the word, and you're the one to read this passage because you are an expert in this, whether you call it ostinato or not. Miles Davis said, "There are no mistakes in life, just opportunities to improvise." I I play jazz piano, so and 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 by ear so i'm always making mistakes and then the trick then is you make one mistake and then you make another to make the first one look as if it were intentional and eventually you might actually sound uh, something like a tune and here um i watch uh, you know i listen to bill evans who take you talk about taking your breath away and miles and all the great improvisers because jazz is the the uh, the art of improvisation um and then i try to translate it into writing and so do you nick the the uh, I can I don't know whether you play the piano, but I can see your keys moving up and down the, the the keyboard as you move from one wonderful section to another and surprise you. Best review I ever got was Pete Hamill, who said he writes to surprise himself. You, Nick, write to surprise yourself. Am I the only one who's not frozen? Nick, are you there? Um, I hope I'm not in trouble. Yeah, should come around. Nick, can you hear me? Hi, I'm back. <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't know what happened with Nick. Hey, Jenny. It actually uh, makes me think, though, what you were writing, I was thinking both of you, and especially in yours, there's so much about music in your book. And there's so many references to, you know, phrases from famous so songs. It was so much to remember in your book. So I was interested just now when you said you play the jazz piano because that music was throughout your whole book. I do it more and more. And um, the older I get and the, the freer my time, um, which is uh, so nice, um, I'm actually getting a little better at it, which is uh, the first time thing I ever got better at, uh, the uh, uh, play, uh, playing uh, jazz piano. Uh, but it is all improvisation. And that's what I was saying to Nick, if we can unfreeze him, 
Yeah, um, and Carrie's working and, on him. Yeah, uh, and uh, and uh, tell him that I am um, so impressed, overwhelmed uh, by what a natural musician he is, uh, whether or not he actually is a musician, because the the whole art of improvisation is embodied in his work. But did you feel like that in your book? Because that is what I, I, the way you kept interspersing a song and you, as you're reading it, you're thinking, oh, that was Jenny, a song, like, it, you know. You're right. And um, uh, uh, Alan Bergman, the lyricist, who yeah. with his wonderful life, Marilyn, wrote The Way We Were and uh, Windows, uh, Windows of Your Mind and, and a variety of other just brilliant standards. He once said that he hears the words in the music. And I realized when he said that, that I hear the music in the words. Wow. So when I, um, uh, when I write, I, it's, not, it's not exactly a tune, but it's kind of approximates a tune. And the reason I write, as does Nick, uh, when I reason I write section to section or fragment to fragment, are movements in music. So that I want to I wanna be able to shift, I want to be able to surprise, as, as I say, I want to be able to surprise myself uh, and, and scare myself a little, you know, you go, you, um, you, you're uh, in, when you play the piano, your fingers can work ahead of you and you can go to places you never thought you'd ever hear before. The same in writing. You suddenly find yourself in a, uh, in a new, in a new uh, field or a, uh, in a new body of water. And then the question is, uh, do you want to get out or do you want to go, go in deeper? So since Nick still isn't back, I want to ask you some more about, so the, the way you were in the book, it is, it is so musical, but it's also just like, I felt it was almost like a puzzle or a game, like so many phrases that I would, you know, if you're reading it, you think like, it just was amazing how you wove it together. Is, is well, I'm, I'm, I'm so, I, I, I couldn't be happier that you liked it, but the, the uh, but sometimes I must say it felt that, that, that it was leading me. And this happens in writing, you know, um, the, you find yourself in a very strange place and then you pursue the strangeness and hope that it comes out to something um, intelligent because for all this, all this talk, which gets a bit fancy, the fact is you must get across to readers. You must make meaning known to readers. Otherwise you're just, uh, just satisfying yourself and playing a kind of self-interested game. Well, Nick is yeah. back, so I'll hop off again, but it was nice to get to ask my big question that I actually had, so thanks. Sorry about that. I'm sorry I missed the questions from Jenny. Yeah. So where were we? And so we were, we, uh, uh, what I was saying to Jenny, and I said to you before you decided to freeze yourself in a very strange uh, 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 thing, but you look good. You look good. I don't even not, know. I don't want to know. Not, how not like a person, but you look good. The, uh, <laughs> um, that you do uh, what I do. Um, I, I, I play jazz piano and I do, uh, um, and I improvise. Your section, you move from section to section, the way I move from section to section, movement to movement, uh, with the idea of surprising the reader, but specifically surprising yourself. And I am, I'm, I'm just breathless with admiration when I read your, uh, when I read your prose. I think it might, have, it might have been some reason they put us together because it does seem to be an affinity with our, the way our, our minds work or something. Um, I, I think it is. we may not appeal to anybody else, but we're certainly very good to each other. <laughs> let's, let's, let's hope there's a couple others. You, you only need a small, even Louise Glick said that uh, she's not looking for like a wide readership. She just wants a small, passionate audience, right? She wants like a, exactly. <laughs> now, then she went and won the Nobel. So, you know. We'll take what we can get. Yeah. Would you read us something from you? Uh, sure, I'll read something. Um, you would ask for one. This, I'll read this first one. Uh, yeah, I think we had talked a little bit, you know, in the green room about uh, that lyric energy uh, that you have, where suddenly, like, I was, I was actually telling some other, I have a writing group that I've been meeting with during COVID, and uh, I was telling about your book after I read it, about, like, because a friend had read a piece, a friend, the, the writer Donna Massini had read a piece that she's working on, and she... And then she just started talking about it. She says, I don't know how to finish this. I don't know how to finish the ending. She just started talking. And it was like a stream of like images. And I said, no, no, wait, you've got to read. I sent her a passage from your book that does this lyric thing that you do, where there's just separated by semicolons, where there's like just all the memories sort of tumble and bounce against each other in these sort of these beautiful lyric passages. I said, just do, do what Roger does. Like, like in this thing, like you can just have all the energy all contained in these one little lyric passage. So I'll read one. You asked me to read a passage, which... Uh, uh, so I'll, I'll read that one first, and then you'll, we'll have you read one of your lyric, uh, lyric passages. 
And then we'll yeah, please to do read to us. Uh, so, so you asked me to read it. There's a section in here at the beginning where, um, you know, the book is uh, basically uh, a lot of it takes place in my childhood. Uh, my daughter turned seven. Uh, she began asking me what it was like when I was seven. And so I, I sort of structured the book around that, like this, you know, telling her these stories of when I was seven. And one of them was, you know, my daughter, my, my, my daughter, my mother would make donuts uh, early in the morning at five in the morning at the, um, at the lo local supermarket. And she'd often take us there when I was six years old. Uh, and that was the year our house caught fire. Um, and she would take us there. And part of it, you know, there's, there's a very good chance my mother set our house on fire uh, to get, collect the insurance money. And so part of it was entering into my mother's consciousness for uh, uh, while she's making the donuts. I want to locate it in a place in this, in this, uh, in this supermarket and then uh, enter into her consciousness of what she's thinking as she's making the donuts. So, and then she would also have, she had several boyfriends. She was young and, and good looking and had a lot of boyfriends. So they would, um, I imagine them coming to her. Cause I, I talked to them. I talked to them later on in life. I, I, I interviewed them all and uh, they would see her. They would see this beautiful young woman in town, like making, you know, whatever she did, she did various jobs. And so this is a cop, this is called the cop. Um, and I made it like a fairy tale with them coming. There's a whole series of them. There's a the cop. There is uh, the carpenter, the fisherman, the insomniac. These are like the men that would come, the insurance man, the, the men that would come to her uh, supermarket and not knock on the window when it was still dark to try to get a donut, uh, a metaphorical donut. Uh, the cop. I remember how it felt the first time the cop tapped his nightstick to the glass. I remember wiping my hands on my apron. I remember how I could not, I remember how I could not not go to him. He was, after all, the law. I remember how he stood there, not smiling, not speaking. I opened the door. Like the others, I had to invite him inside. I remember three days of this, three dark mornings, maybe four, until I grew to wait for him. I remember his nightstick, the sound of it, how it glistened, until I grew to want it. I couldn't stand there long. The donuts, after all, were browning. My kids, after all, were sleeping. <laughs> the dog, after all, was barking. The rats, <laughs> after all, were hungry. That, that was an improvisation there. <laughs> In the end, he was just another worker. In the end, my job was simply to bewilder him. It's so wonderful. All the fear and wonder and curiosity of childhood embodied in what the child sees. You have this gift of looking away from yourself. So few people who write memoirs have that gift. You have the gift of looking away from yourself, which says to the reader, um, yes, this is about me, but it's about me seeing you too. And uh, it's, 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 it's more than impressive. It really is wonderful. Well, thanks. Thanks. Thanks for, you know, I, that's not one that I read that much. It, it takes that, it takes that introduction. I have to introduce the whole piece. So I don't read that piece that much. Uh, it's like I, it a, just, it just knocked me out. I'm, I'm glad you did read thank, it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and, and that was the thing too, with the memoir too, like entering into someone else's consciousness too, and speaking for someone else is a, you know, more of a, a device of fiction, but, you know, I, I sort of feel like if it's your mother, since you are half her, you have half her DNA. You have you're, you're already speaking her words anyway. Your your hands are her hands. You know you have. You said you said something at one point. I don't know where you, is either here or, or maybe in an interview about your thinking that your mother set fire to the house um, in order to see what she was losing. Yeah, Do I have that yeah. right? That was in the book. Yeah, that was in the book. Yeah. Uh, and that is so, that that is such an interesting idea because you know uh, you would think that. Um, why then should, would, why, why is she focusing on the act of losing something and creating that situation by which she is losing something when the end product of losing is loss? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, um, you know, that's one, of, that's one of the riddles. It's like a riddle, right? So you got why we do anything, the, the mysteries of why we do. <laughs> yes, uh, right. What we do is, you know, and often it is to sort of uh, repeat, I think, or to, to somehow, you know, in, in certain psychoanalytical terms to, to, to gain mastery over a situation. So you, you, you repeat it in order to 
uh, feel that you have control over it in some ways. And yet, and yet nobody has control over fire. I mean, the, the brilliance of using this element in the book is that uh, we, you talk at some, at some point about containment and, I, and immediately I thought people try to contain fires. You don't contain fires. Uh, no. the, uh, uh, at least it takes an awfully long time for you to contain uh, fires. And it, the, uh, the passion of it, as well as the fear uh, built into it and the potential destruction uh, of it uh, the, and the power of it and the allure of it, Icarus flying toward it, all of this and the words that go with fire, firefly and you're fired uh, when, you, when somebody's discharged uh, and the fire of somebody who has a passion to do what he's supposed to do uh, and you fire any kiln, you fire uh, pottery so as to give it a glaze, all of that in the word, the, and, you, and you never let go of the word in the book. Uh, the um, I noticed that uh, you can't go a couple of pages before something recalls the fire, uh, the uh, and the, the power of the book, the mesmerizing effect of the book. That, that you know, I was going to say that in your book also, the uh, your like I call you call it you know ostinato, which I'm going to probably steal and you know or at least incorporate that idea. It's, it's all yours. I'm I'm gone anyway. Take it all. <laughs> um, I don't I don't I, I sense not I sense not but. Uh, uh, but, you know, in my, I think of this as a, a closed image system where like each book, each book has its own sort of like little constellation of images that keep getting sort of returned to and gone back to. So in your book, like you have this, these, these things that keep appearing also through it. The, uh, the bird that dies in the window, you know, like, like appears once in the early on and then it comes back at, you know, two more times. It sort of skips across the pond and appears again. Uh, just seeing the ocean, you know, the three, the three windowed room, which is probably near you right now. You could probably turn your camera and we could see this. I imagine we could see this three windowed room. Uh, the, the film, the stairway to heaven, the film, like as a child, like going to see this film. Uh, and then there's the, you know, the sort of, the, the, the thing of the, the kayak, the grief, the daughter, the, you know, that sort of all tied into like, that gets, you know, suggested at the beginning, like resisted being talked about right at the beginning. Like, this is the thing, you, you know, maybe I'll talk about this later. Uh, you know, the, the, the daughter, your daughter. Or, or, or just, you know, it comes to you. And that too is like jazz piano. So you, you, uh, you played one chord earlier in the piece and suddenly the chord winds up insisting on coming back. You have no, you didn't invite it, but there it is. Yeah, it, did, yeah, it didn't feel like it was like, like, you know, sometimes I've read books where like there's that sort of foreshadowing that sort of can annoy me because it seems so, so planned. Like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna withhold, I'm gonna withhold something, you know, but I'll let you know a little bit about it, but I'll withhold, but yours, no, yours felt just like, really naturally, like just a conversation. Like but you were, and you were saying too about the structure of the piece. It's very, when people write with the attitude that you and I uh, share uh, about the uses of prose and what we can do with the poetic prose and see if we can bring the uh, reader into our song, it's very important to have structure because otherwise there's, no, there's nothing for our reader to hold on to. And you have great structure in this book. You have the structure of the visits with your daughter, the visits uh, uh, to Situate. And um, in Kayak Morning, uh, and, I, and in, 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 the, uh, in Cold Moon, I have the structure of life, love, and responsibility, and I never let go of those. But in Kayak Morning, it was hard, because that was a book about grief, the grief of how we lost our daughter when she was 38. And the uh it was uh i had written making toast about our family's response to it but uh kayak morning was my way of getting into the grief myself going out in my kayak and and thinking and i thought i wondered how i was going to propel this book so as to say uh, to the reader stay with me on this little voyage and what i did is i just invented a conversation with a shrink uh the uh i didn't go to the shrink but uh, she was very helpful to our grandchildren. And I had her say to me, half annoyed, what do you want? What is exactly, what do you want? Mm -hmm. And then I said simply, I want my daughter back. I want her back. And that impossible quest then propelled the book. Uh, so it was fairly easy for me to constantly go back to, uh, am I getting her back? How do I get her back? And at the end, I tried to show that there might be a way to get her back. Yeah, I mean, that, you know, the. In that, like the, you know, you said that fire is like the thing that goes through my book, and and you know, for you, it does feel like water is the, you know, that this yes, water sir. that goes through yours. It's, you know, I think I think each book has its own element, also. I think that Be because because I was pissed off that you you wrote three books in a year, I wrote a third book, uh, which I just finished, 
uh, and it's and it's not on the ocean; it's on the bay. But it is all it, it is all it is all water. So between us, we've covered two major elements: uh, <laughs> fire and water. And that should be our next book that we write together. Yes, <laughs> I would I would love that. Um, do, you want, do you want me to read you this this what this uh, miracle passage? Yes, please, please do. And also, just to remind people, if you have questions, to put them in the Q and A. Uh, you know, and we'll, we'll be getting to those in a little bit, but yeah, we need to hear some of your, some of your words. So what I, what I do once in a while, and Nick kind of referred to it, is I just put together things that um, make us, they, they have a little point that comes out from time to time, but they, it's an aggregation of images that uh, I hope in the collective uh, creates a feeling, uh, a, feel, uh, a feeling and an understanding. What, what page Blood are Roses. Are you, Sorry. Are you what page you're reading? What page? It's page three, and I've, I've edited it, page three and four. Okay, great, great. Blood Roses, life. A golden bubble of the sun, a rhetoric of shadows, redeeming snow, life. The click of the lock, the crackpot, the camo kayak, the littered dock and mottled face of the kiosk, where is the drowned girl, life. The annals of your eyes, blood on a boxing glove, blood on a tunic. Well, did you ever, what a swell party this is, life. If you're ever in a jam, here I am. If you're ever in a jelly, rub my belly, life. Coffee grounds on Stephen Sunday morning. They clog the drain, evidence of rain, ravens explode upward in a black parachute, life. A flattery of moonlight, redeeming moonlight, and the cold moon acknowledges the glitter of the sea as a day moth folds its wings and sings, good night, ladies, it swings. Moth dreams, rub your angry skin till it's raw, blood on your knuckles, blood on your thighs, cast your aspersions to the winds, your icons, bygones, frantic, pedantic, antic, Atlantic, life, life, life. <laughs> That, that was one I was going to have you read that one, but there's like, you know, <laughs> like I said, we said before, like I was just going to have Roger read the whole book. Um, yeah, that's I, nice. I don't know why you didn't do that. <laughs> you're doing like in this, in these pieces, like to me, they feel, they feel to me like the, um, like holograms of the whole book. Like they contain all the energy of the whole book and these, you know, they're, they definitely have poetic energy. Uh, they have your, um, your wild sense of play, uh, you know, like, like you just did, like you just riffed, you know, uh, in, in real time on, on the idea of fire and on fire, getting fired, getting, which I didn't have, you know, I didn't have people getting fired in, in my book, but you sort of can see all the different sort of. Once, 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 once a great writer starts you off, you cannot help but go downhill. Uh, it's like skiing on, on, a, uh, on, a, on a slalom. So yeah. when, you, when you have a first rate creative mind like yours, you do something to the reader. And you and I know both, because I think we've both spoken of it uh, in interviews and other places, uh, certainly to students, the importance of the reader. Let the reader do some of the work. The reader wants to be involved in your book. Open up the, spa uh, open up the space so that the reader gets in. You do that so beautifully. Well, I think there's a, there's a Whitman quote about it that, that you know, the book doesn't exist without the reader, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, uh, you know, that it, and we do writer. not know who the reader is. We don't know who the reader is. And the, the, the strangeness yeah. of the, one of the many strangenesses of our strange way of life is we don't know who, for whom we're writing. We don't yeah. know their lives. We don't know where they live. We want to sympathize with them. We don't know why. We don't know what there is to sympathize with them. But mm -hmm. we send our words out and hope that, uh, and hope against hope uh, that uh, they embrace our readers and the readers embrace our words. I mean, that's a big part of your, the whole, this project, and I, I sense the whole, you know, your entire, you know, body of work uh, is just that thing that, that, you know, you, you repeat this often through the book too. You said like life, love, responsibility, you know, we don't live, a, we don't live alone upon this earth. We're responsible for each other. I'm quoting you back to yourself. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, just that, that sense of like sort of openness to life, even, even at the end, like, um, you get, you get all poems or elegies at heart, broken heart, everything observed, everything that happens or has happened about what you write is attended by loss. As soon as your thought hits the paper, you lose it. As soon as your words hit the paper, you lose it. No wonder there is a feeling of perpetual dissatisfaction when one finishes a piece of writing. Fearing to lose all, you lose all anyway. Um, it's something like really like expansive and comforting and, you know, generous and, 
you know, you're writing this as if, you know, you're writing, you know, from this place, the age you are and suggesting that you're looking back and like, you just joked like, well, this is the last thing I'll do and you can have it all. And, um, but it, it, it really feels like that's like, there's something very big about that and very almost there's moments where it gets very Whitman-esque too. You sort of skip some of them in your, um, in the piece you wrote where you are, you become everything, you know, um, uh, in, in that piece that you just read, I, in the other hand, I am not myself. In the other hand, life, uh, life, a, a success of geese, like all the things that you're listing here, um, by the naming them or just by being a, a, a human being that's awake to the world, you become part of it. They all become part of you, which is something amazing also. And you, and you, take, the, you take the same stance. You may not uh, do exactly what I'm doing, but you do something uh, uh, astonishingly well, I'm reading from Life is Sweet from the poems, I Will Destroy You. For the next few years, we might need to live in some kind of aquarium, some semi-transparent and uh, something tra semi-transparent and lit by those blue lights, maybe some of those unnatural pink rocks along the bottom, but I can't see us contained in an aquarium unless it were, you know, the size of an ocean. Still, I worry sometimes how everything can be contained turned into a poem and it goes on. Uh, the whole, this, this, this wonderful idea of how everything can be contained and I mean, every writer is, tries to be an expert in containment. We've got all the thoughts, all the, um, all the emotions, all the things we wish to tell the reader and tell ourselves and learn about ourselves contained in, on a page and a page in a book. The, uh, the, the whole, the whole, and then I think of fire again, and people try to contain a fire. I keep thinking those words coming back where John Dunn is saying, I am a little world made cunningly. Richard Wilbur, Nick, Richard Wilbur said something that I always treasured. He said, the strength of the genie comes from the fact that it lives in a bottle. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah. <laughs> it's so right, you know, um, yeah. the, uh, uh, the, all the power coming from the containment. And then you have here, I worry, uh, I worry that everything can be contained. Yeah, the, you know, there's that unease with too, the, you know, a certain unease with what we're doing, like at least with me, I'm not sure if you have the same, you seem to have a lot of joy in the writing. And like I say, that sort of limberness, it's just sort of like it's flowy. There's a real flow to your writing. Um, there was no, I've, I've gotten better. Uh, there wasn't always yeah. that flow. And when there was a flow, there was a lack of clarity. And, and only in the last few years and last few books have I seemed to be able to marry uh, clarity with the, with the rhythms and the, and the yeah. sound. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing to, uh, to witness. Um, let's, um, let's take one little quick look at a question. There's a four questions. Let me just take just a thing. I, but I, I do want to hear another piece. Let, let, yeah, let's, let's look at the question. I'll look at the questions now and see. Uh, I'll look at a couple of them. Um, all right. Uh, so here's one, this one that I'll, I'll sort of put it out there. What are some improvisational musical books that serve as touchstones for you? He gave, uh, Brian gave a couple of uh, examples of what we could think of. And he, he put in Stein and Gas as a couple of possibilities. Um, uh, it's possible, but it's subliminal. Um, the I I work. I was t I, uh, w while you were in uh, uh, frozen space. Um, I was saying that the uh, uh, that uh, Alan Bergman, the lyricist, said that he hears the words in the music, and I was uh, saying that I hear the music in the words. So it's not, I don't really, I don't go towards, I'm not conscious of the influences. I'm sure that they're there and, and uh, because I like to read and because I like to admire, but um, I, do hear, I do hear the music and the words and then I try to make the movements of the book uh, interesting enough to have, have uh, surprises as well as, uh, as well as melody. Yeah, I, I would say like for me, um, uh, the books where I mostly get the sense of music is from poetry. Uh, you know, you know, I, I read, you know, primarily poetry, uh, and you know that's built on music. I mean, it's like it's part of it. But whether it's, uh, you know, just the sonic effects of it, the the sounds of it, um, and so, uh, and it's this beautiful at this moment. There's beautiful poems being written uh, right at this moment about 
uh, uh, you know, things that are like, you know, urgent in the culture, but also that are just sort of deep and go back like centuries. Uh, so I'm just, yeah, I, I, I primarily keep returning to poetry, so. Uh, I, love, I love your poetry. I love the nerve to write poetry. I wanted to be a poet. Uh, and I was in Robert Lowell's seminar, uh, which was scary as hell, a uh, hundred years ago. Uh, but I didn't have the nerve, and frankly, I didn't have the patience. Uh, the uh, I didn't have the patience to make myself the poet that I wanted to be or to be noticed. And I was suffered from that. I suffered from that curse. I wanted to be noticed. So poetry was not going to leave me there, I thought. Uh, but you, you do, you do both beautifully and, and look at you, a book of poems and two books of prose in a single year. Yeah, yeah that's, you know, and then I, it's like, I, I'm going to take a break for a while. So after this, <laughs> uh, let's see, let's see, um, let's look at another one. Um, uh, uh, here's one. Um, how do you read as a writer? Uh, yeah, we'll answer. We'll look at that. How do you read as a writer? Um, we we steal. Uh, just it, it's it's an act of theft, and we we hover over the book and we see what we can uh, steal and get away with. I'm half kidding around, but the fact is that when you admire something so much in another writer, one way or another, you are going to lift it. Uh, the, the, you don't want your fingerprints on it, so you make it your own. But there's an awful lot of, there's a very <laughs> thin line between admiration and theft among writers. Um, yeah, I mean, you can see the influences sort of like, like, like flowing through your work and, and, you know, through mine too. Like we, and generally since, uh, you know, we don't want to plagiarize anything, but we also uh, want to acknowledge the influences. We want to acknowledge that we're, you know, part of this whole, in this flow. I mean, I don't really feel that, I don't really feel that I write the books. Um, I, I'm not really one that thinks of like the, the idea of the heroic artist, the sole heroic artist where I'm alone and I'm creating everything. It really is part of like, I get influenced by everything, by everything I read. I'm, I'm deeply influenced now by you, Roger, from reading your book. And I would say you are, you've done the, the thing uh, that you wanted to do, like you, you've managed to become a poet. You write a book that doesn't have poetry in the title, yet the book is like pure poetry. You know, like it's a. It's well, a I, I I thank you for that. That's the highest compliment I can get, especially from somebody as good as you. Um, yeah. Okay. We have a couple more here, uh, and yeah, I guess the reason a writer is that I think I I I I'll often like it, it will be bad. Sometimes it, I'll, I'll read things that it can be a curse too, because I can't just sort of settle in. Like my, my, my wife is an actor and she can't sometimes settle in to just watch a movie because she'll be, she knows what's happening, right? <laughs> like that this is all an artifice and she knows that right beyond, you know, beyond that wall is a whole crew of people and that, you know, they did this take 20 times where I can just sort of forget that. I, can, I don't have to think about that. Whereas your, can, your yeah. wife is a fall on the floor, wonderful actor. And, and uh, 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 Lily Taylor appeared in, the movie that, at least to my mind, gave the best representation of a writer that I've ever seen. And that was called Going oh. Out in the Evening. Yeah, uh, yeah. And Frank Langella, do you remember this? Oh, um, yeah, of course gorgeous. you do, because you, you live with her. <laughs> but <laughs> the fact that she, the she's, set. She's, she's stunning in everything and she was stunning in this. And so is Langella. Lan, 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 what Langella did not do in that movie is it was the best representation of a writer I've ever seen. Yeah. He, he said, he said, because it, it got a lot of attention, and they, but when they made it, they made it with no money at all. It was like such a low budget movie. When they did the reading at the Y, the 92nd Street Y, they literally went out on the sidewalk and pulled people in from the street. <laughs> and there, there was a guy sitting there who was just like completely sweating because like he was just, he'd been running or something. They had like, they had like that guy, like we can't have him just sitting there sweating. Like they had to like move people out. And, uh, but Langella afterwards, when he saw the movie goes like, he said to Lily, he's like, he's like, can you believe it? Like, how did that, that little nothing, that little nothing movie, they made this, this beautiful, it's a work of art, it's a gorgeous movie. It um, is a go absolutely gorgeous movie. And no, uh, she, she holds it together as the moral force of the, of the, uh, of the yeah. book because of the movie, because he is, he is quasi tormented by this uh, uh, rapacious graduate student uh, who yeah. is uh, um, going to make life very difficult for him. And she, his daughter, Langella's daughter, uh, knows to protect him. Yeah. Starting out in the evening, is that the title of it? Starting out in the evening, I think so. Yeah, I think so too. Um, Go home and ask. <laughs> I can just yell upstairs. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Here's one. Uh, this is a question for Nick. 
I was in charge of bringing him, me, to my college for Ohio. And he said that we were the first school who ever dared to pick succeed for a campus read. I remember that. Yes, you made cups and you made also t-shirts and things and bookmarks like with another bullshit night in Suck City on it. Thank you. I was so happy. <laughs> I, still have, I still have that memorabilia because you still are the only one. <laughs> uh, he was, very, uh, he, I was, Nick was very open and welcoming to students. And I think we had fun driving in my Volvo. <laughs> hey, Brina. Uh, anyway, the question is about the reenactments and the ticking is the bomb. When you write, do you take a note of the phrases and ideas you want to repeat? Or else, uh, what is your method of drawing and concepts several times as threads throughout your memoirs? I mean, yeah, we can both answer that. That's the ostinato uh, again. Um, often, like when, when I'm writing, they, they often come to me, um, it'll, it'll re recur because I haven't quite used, Jung has this phrase where as long as uh, an energy, as long as an image is alive, it keeps spinning off meaning. Like it'll keep spinning off meaning. So we have these images that we carry with us from childhood. Like, you know, if we had gotten into talking about, you know, some of the, the images that, you know, thread through Roger's book, um, uh, that, that they, we keep returning to them. We don't know exactly why, we have to trust that they still have energy to them. They keep spinning off meaning. Um, and so they, it, it's not really a conscious thing until I go to structure the book and then I'll often see something, maybe it'll be an entire uh, chapter that has like, it's, it's focusing on one thing. And I'll break that chapter in two sometimes. I think I don't, if all the energy is contained here, it'll be lost. Like it's, it gets deeper if you break it in two and move it to some later in the book. Uh, you know, that's one thing that I do. So I, I, I sort of then sort of start to um, figure out the score of the book, uh, you know. <laughs> And the, and the force of and the strength of your images, too, is that um, although it's a slightly a pretense, the reader coming upon them thinks that he's discovered something that you didn't. That, well, that it, it just lives as an accident in the pages. And of course, it did not. As a, well, it's a quasi accident in the sense that it occurred to you to put in a certain spot. But the, back to the reader's delight of saying, I remember that. Yeah, it. it, it um... I mean, we have it with you with that when we just read that the piece you read with the moth, you mentioned the moth and the moth keeps coming back at different points, like, and then it gets a Virginia Wolf with the moth and, you know, it sort of yeah. keeps weaving through the whole book. Um, uh, yeah, okay, let's read another question. Uh, it, time is just gall gallops along here, but here's, here's one for you, Roger. Uh, not sure how to ask, just trying. Roger, you have your incredible background as a journalist as well, the beautiful incantation in your writing, talking about Rwanda, people in the river. Yeah, we never even got to like how you just touch on these like, things that you've done in your life, these huge things you've done in your life. You contain them uh, in these in these moments and things. Eyes open, mouth open, mouths open. And Nick, you have the experience of witnessing the interviews with the Abu Ghraib prisoners. You both bear witness and question our very humanness of these and other horrible tragedies. And you also have written so beautifully of your own personal tragedies. Can you talk about this somehow? The ability for you to look at the very worst experiences and educate the rest of us. Um, and then she says, oh, I'm so glad to see the two, you two together, such a perfect pairing, which I, I agree. Well, I, I, I think so too. I think we were damn lucky. Or these Brattleboro people are really smart. Yeah. The, the, um, the, uh, and, uh, and tasteful, because this was, this was pure gold for me. I do remember uh, seeing things that uh, the last, actually the last trip I made, um, I didn't really seek this stuff out. It was just, I was an essayist and you, you get tired of being an essayist in journalism. You start, it's called thumb sucking and you're sitting around, you're doing, you're not doing very much. So every chance I got, I would go towards a place. And it's better to go to a, to a dangerous place than a, uh, uh, a uh, serene place, uh, just because you will see more and the images will be sharper. But I do remember standing on the bridge over the Kagera River uh, in uh, Rwanda and watching the bodies rise over the falls and come flowing down into uh, the water and then out to Lake, Lake Victoria, body after body after body uh, coming down. That was the last trip I made of that sort. I, that I, by, by that time, I was less enthralled as, with my abilities as a writer than I was um, made glum by uh, people's capacity to knock one another off. I couldn't, uh, I, 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 I remember thinking that's, uh, that's enough for me. The, uh, you do see a lot. And one of the things that Nick does um, just wonderfully, naturally, you gotta see very well as a writer. Writers have to see very well. 
and you have to make the reader see very well so that the even the worst things like the thing that i described and i did see worse actually worse than that in cambodia um you have to uh you ha you have to steel yourself and say I am going to tell you exactly what I saw, even though this will bring you to your knees, because without that, you will not know what the world is composed of. Yeah, it, do, it does seem it's, it's the, the job of, of artists. Uh, it does seem it's part of our job is to, to go to places that are difficult for other people to go to, uh, you know, psychically, even, you know, physically going to, you know, putting yourself, you know, in, in Rwanda and all the, all the situations you put yourself in. Uh, which I mean, when you were saying that, it reminded me of your book also, Cold Moon, where you just talk about as a child, how you would just wander off from your parents and just go, you know, you were sort of set to do that for your whole life. I, like, will, bet, I will bet that you were that kid too. <laughs> no, but my, my, my mother didn't notice. So. <laughs> <laughs> Neither did, not, that's the other thing. That, I mean, we could speak, we could talk a lot. At the yeah. age of six, just at the age that you were when the fire happened, at the age of six, my brother was born, he was born frail, and my parents shifted their attention from me to yeah. him, and I was alone for the rest of my childhood. Yeah, so the, yeah. the, the, I, 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 remember, I remember it with great sadness, but nonetheless, it, it taught me to live in the world. Yeah, and to, and to be able to wander into Rwanda and like have a sense of, <laughs> like, yeah, you know, I seem to have the ability to adjust to any circumstances, you say, and then he thinks the world is waiting for him to walk in and play the piano. <laughs> like the... <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, why isn't, why isn't that so? Um, I think we're almost at the end. Like, let me read one more question just because it's from someone I know. Um, and I'm sorry, I've, a couple people, uh, I didn't get to read the questions, but this is, I've been reading Will Atkins' Antigone Undone, where Atkins contemplates a modern production of the ancient play and the universal themes and the con constancy of human suffering. In prep for this meeting, I picked up Nick's book and opened it randomly to read a section. I opened to the chapter Antigone. There it was again. <laughs> I thought, does the tragedy ever end? Does the container that your strength to write come from also contain the despair? Wow. That's, this is a buddy of mine that I worked with at a homeless shelter during our 20s. We worked together. That's another thing we have in common. We both worked in homeless shelters. No, you have that. Yeah, you still do, don't you? Do you, do you still do? Uh, I, 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 haven't, I haven't recently, but I, I spent uh, 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 time on the Upper West Side. Uh, yeah. And um, I think it's important for writers to go to the people who need them, uh, mm -hmm. uh, even in, in uh, some, some small gesture like working in a homeless shelter. Yeah, and I think it, this goes back to the uh, question before, too, like containing the despair. Yeah, suffering is part of life. It is, it is a thing, and it is our job as artists to go to those places and to look at them and then to, you know, it's not to make something of it, but just to sort of, I don't even know if I want to call it bearing witness or just to uh, acknowledge it and just to, to, you know, we give language to it in some way. We, we offer La La Jenny, do I, have, do, do I have time for a very quick anecdote? Sure. Okay, this so. is out of the homeless section because Nick will get a kick out of this. When you, uh, the, uh, uh, they were wonderful people and we were writing a journal about them and they all knew us. And some of them lived in the shelter and some of them lived in Central Park. One guy lived in a tree. Anyway, I was walking down the street and uh, one of the people, Charlie, who had, uh, and they knew me, I mean, they knew me by name, uh, had set up a living room on the, on the sidewalk outside a Methodist church. He had scavenged in the garbage for a, a couch and a lamp and plugged into nothing and a, uh, and a coffee table and he's sitting there in his living room. So I joined Charlie in his living room and I'm sitting uh, ta uh, uh, talking with him. And, um, the, and the cops didn't bother him, which was very nice of them. Uh, they just let him have his little living room outside. Anyway, I'm talking with him, talking and boring him clearly as I'm boring you. And finally he says, well, Roger, I've enjoyed this chat, but I'm expecting guests. <laughs> <laughs> This has been so amazing. I think I might listen to this again afterwards. Every, so many things were brought up in this discussion. And I want to tell you, I Roger, want to- Let's stay in touch, Roger, okay? Uh, yes, man. There's, there's no way that's not going to happen. I want to tell you that there's a shout out to Sandy Rouse, who's the co-founder and director of our festival. And every time, this is the, the magic of the Brattleboro Literary Festival. She picks people, she puts them together, and we often say, wait, why are you putting those two people together? Or what, and she just says, you'll, not, you'll find out. So this, when you mentioned that, this is what she does. And this is even 
it yeah. is virtual. This is the Brattleboro Literary Festival. She creates these moments that Made are and Made friendships. And I can see you guys will be back in touch. So, We're grateful to her. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. And I want to also um, just let everyone know the books, their books are available on bookshop.org. And I well, also want to oh, you have, show the book if you have it. Oh, and, um, yeah. Please consider a donation also to the Brattleboro Literary Festival. It's free to attend, but we do have very real expenses. And next year will be our 20th anniversary. The link nice. to donate is on our website, brattleborolliteraryfestival.org. So thank you, everybody, for coming. And thank you, Nick and Roger. This was wonderful. Pleasure for us. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye.